Good evening, everybody. Do I? Okay. Um, thank you so much for coming out and participating in this wonderful, wonderful presentation of information in regards to human trafficking. We have two great presenters. One is Lieutenant Wendy Reyes from the Oakland County Sheriff's Department, and another one will be Courtney Faraday from All Worthy of Love. Okay? Thank you. Good evening. This is a little bit bigger crowd than I thought we were going to have tonight, but um, it's good to see you. Um, we are splitting a, the time. We're trying to stick to the time frame, so I'm going to move through this stuff. But before I get started, um, I just wanted to tell you that I'm a lieutenant with the sheriff's office. Um, I've been there five years. Prior to that, I was a uh, captain and a chief in uh, Pontiac Police um, for 24 years of a career. And um, so I've had a lot of contact with victims of crime and um, situations where trauma is involved. So um, I'm going to try to move through this, but I did also want to say that I always um, give a disclaimer. I see some young kids here. Um, I think it's a good thing. Uh, if it was my children, I would certainly have them informed on this. But I do want to say that human trafficking is an ugly, ugly topic, and I can't make it pretty. <laughs> so it's ugly, and if you have any um, concern for your children, um, you know, this being a problem for them, or if, you know, have an audience this size, um, a lot of times uh, we have survivors in the audience, maybe not of human trafficking, but of... Uh, uh, sexual assault or domestic violence type situations um, you know just understand that it's going to be hard some of the things that are going to we're going to see and if you have to take care of yourself and step out do that um, because it, I can't talk about human trafficking and make it pretty because it's pretty ugly and my clicker's not working so I'm going to have to stand here and uh, talk but we're going to move through it um, one of the things I just want to talk about is just imagine what it would be like to wake up every day with nothing shielding you from violence. Um, people want to make this topic, uh, oh, that's prostitution, it's a choice, it's this, it's that. And I'm not saying that that can't happen. Uh, someone make a choice. Um, but m a lot of the time, it's not a choice, whether it's prior life experience or force, fraud, or coercion is used to get people into human trafficking. And it's not the pretty woman story. It's horrible, violent. Um, I'm just going to briefly go over the laws on human trafficking. First of all, there's two kinds of trafficking. One is labor trafficking and one is sex trafficking. Sex trafficking gets all the media, um, but to be quite honest, there's more labor trafficking in this state than there is sex trafficking. So. Um, keep that in mind as we're going through the PowerPoint, and when I tell you different locations you might find a victim or spot a victim um, of trafficking, that it's not just sex trafficking, but labor trafficking as well. Um, I don't think the pointer's working. Nope. Okay, so anyway, when you have labor trafficking, it's the harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use. Three words are very important, force, fraud, or coercion. Those are the three words, three things that, one of the three things that you'd have to prove in court to convict someone of trafficking. And I, I can't, I don't like all the words, but involuntary servitude, p and debt bondage, what human trafficking is is slavery. And um, I don't think we should use a bunch of pretty words to make it sound like something it's not. Um, but it occurs in domestic servitude, factory, agricultural work, which we have plenty of in the state of Michigan. Sex trafficking uses the same words, force, fraud, or coercion, but there is a commercial sex act involved, which can be uh, sexual acts in themselves, can be pornography, or it can be um, other things involving sex where money or services or property is transferred. Uh, the thing you have to remember, though, is if someone is under the age of 18 
and is compelled or does commercial sex acts, they are a victim of a crime. They're, they can't be um, held, like people use this in the same sentence, a child prostitute, there's no such thing. If they're a child, they're a victim, period. So anybody under 18, you don't have to show for, force, fraud, or coercion, just that a commercial sex act has taken place. Um, for labor trafficking, uh, there's many places that you can find victims of labor trafficking. And of course, there's a lot of businesses that run and a lot of things that happen in these areas that aren't labor trafficking. But in places that they can be found are door-to-door -door sales, farm work, cleaning services, construction, um, domestic servitude, um, and nannies are big ones exotic dancing factories. Now, just to give a couple quick exa examples, um, in 1998 in Auburn Hills, there was a cardiologist. Him and his wife lived in a house and they had a nanny. Um, she lived, in, she didn't speak very good English and she lived um, on the floor in the laundry room like a dog. She did all of the services for the house, all of the laundry, all of the food, all, everything. Her documents were held and she wasn't paid. And at night, uh, the husband in the house would come and sexually assault her. And I use sexual assault, but um, we, I don't like to use a pretty term either, but with kids here. Um, so she came out of her house one day when they were gone, bringing change to the next door neighbor and said, can you make dollars out of this? I need dollars. I'm guessing she probably found the change in the clothes when she did the laundry. And the lady next door made dollars for her out of her change, but asked her, what, what is going on? Can I help you? Um, she was a young girl who should have probably been in school. And um, so she got befriended the neighbor, of course, against the rules of the house. Um, and one day they made a plan to have her escape, and she escaped. Thank goodness Auburn Hills police officer that long ago when human trafficking, nobody knew there wasn't even such a thing as human trafficking in the words, in the crime there was. So he got her information, went back to the house, told the owner of the house, you give me her documents right now or I'm gonna take you to jail. He got the documents, gave it to the officer. Well, they got more information in their investigation. Two days later, they went back. The cardiologist's house was cleaned out and he was out of the country. So that was back in 1998. Um, and in Rochester, Michigan, uh, one of my sergeants, when he found out about human trafficking, said, oh my gosh, there was a woman there um, that called for help from China. Same thing. She was working in a Chinese restaurant in Rochester Hills. He goes to her apartment, flop mattresses all over the floor. Um, that's what they do a lot. They'll make them live in a house, make them eat the food that they pay. So they might make $2,000 a month, but oh, all your rent and your food cost $1,800, so I get to keep your money. Or you owe me for whatever. If you get a new job, you know, I'll call the police and tell them that, you know, your legal visa is up or you're doing something illegal, and they're very terrified. So he went to the boss, same thing, and said, listen, give her her payment and give her her ID. And if you can imagine that it was so horrible here that she wanted to go back to China instead of being in America. So she was being trafficked in a Chinese restaurant where you would go every day and eat and never even recognize that um, she was a victim. Um, labor trafficking, I just got a couple pictures here. I'm not gonna go into both of the stories because of time, but on the left, there was a replica for court when they went to trial of a house where a lady who had special needs was held in this house with her young daughter and she was forced to do all of the labor. She was beaten, threatened with snakes. She was allowed to go out to the store, but they had her daughter and they told her, you know, we're going to kill your daughter if you don't come back and if you don't keep your mouth shut. Well, she, they wouldn't feed her properly and she got caught by a police officer stealing a candy bar. And thank goodness the police officer didn't just take the case as a candy bar. He asked more questions and found out what was going on. And, and that happened in Ohio in 2012, and the husband and wife, or man and woman in the house that were abusing her, um, ended up getting 30 years in jail. So it's, there, it takes many forms, 
And a lot of times it can, we can miss it. You know, it's real easy to miss. Um, other places victims are found, hotels, massage parlors, nail salons, uh, migrant workers, restaurants, truck stops. Um, truck stops are a big one. Um, they have uh, truckers now getting education, and I've known a few cases where truck drivers have actually had helped assist getting victims rescued because they just called the number and said, no, this isn't right. There's this 15-year-old girl. She looks scared to death. Craigslist, back page, you know, Craigslist, you can buy a table, a chair, and a child. Or living next door to you. Um, some signs of being trafficked. If it's uh, labor, a lot of times they're not in control of their money, their ID, their documents, if they're a foreign national. Again, most of, a lot of the victims here are American citizens. Um, sometimes drug addiction is involved, substance abuse, unexplained gifts, cell phones, uh, changes in behavior. A lot of kids, once they get ro roped into this type of thing, um, you know, they'll go from an A student to a, you know, F student. Um, we had some questions when we did this training before um, from schools asking, we're saying, you know, if there's a 25-year-old trying to date your 15-year-old, no, that's it, just no, you know, but schools were having a problem with, you know, proms and different dances. Well, how do we not let the 27-year-old come? Oh, easy, say no, you know, but they were really seriously going, what, what do we do here? She says her date is this man, you know, so Um, and I think, for me, one of the most important things that people understand about um, victimization, either sex or labor, um, is the victim's mindset and how um, society, especially with sex trafficking or sexual assault, uh, have the habit of blaming the victim or, or not believing the victim, which is really destructive to a survivor. And so I'm just going to go through a couple of them. I like to show this because I can't use the pictures of the women that I know because they're local and someone would probably know them. Uh, but this woman, this was a two year uh, time frame. And I know a lot of people like to say, let's just legalize prostitution, it's a victimless crime. I don't know, does that look victimless to anybody? I don't think it does. And what I've seen in 28 years, it's never victimless. And um, when I was at Pontiac, we put two um, serial rapists in jail for um, raping prostitutes. And people want to go, well, they can't be raped. Yeah, yes, they can. Um, understanding trauma, and trauma can be anything, like a terrible event, accident, rape, natural disaster, um, that kind of thing. And its long-term reaction include flashbacks, strained relationships, PTSD. Um, and the higher rates of PTSD come when the victims aren't treated properly when they disclose, if they disclose, because a lot of victims won't disclose. That's why they go unkept. I had bosses ask me, why don't we have victims? Why don't we have more victims? I said, because victims don't call 911. If you got your car stolen, you got your house broken into, you're going to call 911. Victims of trafficking feel like they're in trouble, that they're the ones that are going to be, um, you know, go to jail because their traffickers have told them that. And um, so our reaction to the victims are, is very important um, to support them. Um, Uh, and I got one more video, which I'd rather throw. I'll just leave that one out uh, to save time. But um, this is another picture of a young lady. Guess how old she is in the first picture, upper left. Anybody? Yep, exactly, 15. 
Lower right is 17. All of these pictures are taken in mugshots because she was arrested instead of rescued, instead of treated, being treated like a victim. Um, unfortunately, after this, she died. Um, you know, some victims make it out, some victims don't make it out. Um, but now the good news is we have laws in place that we don't, we, it's not allowed. We never did arrest juveniles but for prostitution, but um, some places did. And um, now it's illegal. You can't arrest juveniles because it's, they are considered victims by law if they're under the age of 18. Um, we have uh, effects on children. And people, you know, I know we don't like to hear it. We don't like to see it. But, you know, we think of teenagers being trafficked. But the problem is children are trafficked. I'm talking, well, teenagers are children, but eight-year-old children are trafficked, three-year-old children are trafficked. The new commodity is infants. Infants. As horrible as that sound, it's going. Imagine having that kind of trauma happen to you as a three-year-old. You don't even really have words at that point. How do you tell? And some of the um, effects on children are PTSD. Uh, sometimes they'll get diagnosed with ADD. ADD is real, it happens, but also sometimes it's unresolved trauma um, in children. So this is one more. Um, sweet little baby up in the left, and this was eight months. Eight months. It's not a victimless crime. Don't kid yourself. Um, again, understanding trauma Treating victims appropriately is going to help um, have better outcomes, better chance for prosecution. And the bottom line is every person they tell can harm or heal, and there's no in-between. There's no middle road. Um, the number one thing victims want is to be believed. You know, and don't get me wrong. People go, well, people lie. Yeah, but you don't understand. It's this much. It's so, so little compared to what people have to say about it. Um, trauma physically changes our brain. Uh, I like to describe it like this is your prefrontal cortex. And so let's say my hand is my brain. This right here is a prefrontal cortex. Uh, when trauma occurs, boom, that's gone. First of all, children, any child or teenager, all of us at 15 thought we were grown and knew everything. Um, unfortunately, the frontal lobe is not developed until they're in their mid-20s. Um, so they don't have all the planning, the decision-making skills at that age to begin with. But when a trauma occurs, whether you're an adult or a child, that frontal lobe shuts down because now you're left with your amygdala, which is your survival um, part of the brain. And so it's your fear center, and it stores emotional memory. That's why if I ask you to recount your day right now, if nothing traumatic happened, you could probably tell me A to Z. But why, when a victim is traumatized, they tell you a story. It's like pulling sticky notes down out of their brain, going, well, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. It's all true, but for the law enforcement, we don't get it in nice, orderly fashion. We want A to Z. It doesn't happen like that. And, and sometimes victims can bury memories because it was so traumatic, they can't um, remember it exactly right after it happened. So rational thoughts impaired, uh, control of attention is lost, and that's why um, we don't ask the question. I have my favorite slide coming up later. We don't ask why questions because they're vic victim blaming and accusatory. Here is the, on the left side is a normal frontal lobe with all the connectors connecting in the circles. The right side is a long-term trauma victims. This is neurological, it changes your brain. It changes who you are. And the, uh, the one on the right side, the connectors don't connect. Therefore, your rational thought planning skills are diminished, you know. Um, I had a victim one time that I dealt with who was under long-term trauma, and um, she was in her 20s when she got out of it. It started when she was 10. I thought, 
oh, she's a teenager kind of there. No, she was a 10-year-old. Um, and it was very difficult to, like, try to respect her and get her help as an adult when you're dealing with a 10-year-old brain. But good news is they can reconnect, maybe not to 100%, but she's in college and she's living on her own and working. So uh, the responses of the brain and body um, freeze. Everybody's heard that. You freeze. And then fight or flight, everyone's heard that. But the one that people don't understand or don't know about is tonic immobility. And tonic immobility is um, where it's an automatic or auto economic response, it's uncontrollable. When you're in extremely fearful situations, 33 to 50% of the time, uh, rape victims, sexual assault victims, will have tonic immobility. And what that is, is your brain, it's like when the bear attacks you and you think, oh my God, I'm gonna die, I'm so afraid, your brain shuts down your body. And that's a good news if you're getting attacked by a bear because you stop moving and the bear thinks you're dead and maybe isn't hungry and will leave. Maybe not such a good thing when you're being sexually assaulted and your body shuts down and you can't fight back. And that's why asking a victim, why didn't you yell, why didn't you run, is really ridiculous when 50% of the time they're incapable. And they don't know. I mean, when you ask them why, they're like, I don't know. Because they don't know. Who can say, my body froze, I couldn't move. But it happens. It's called rape paralysis also. Um, disassociation, I don't have time for that. Why is, no, don't do it. Um, this country, we have to stop blaming victims. We have to start believing children when they tell us that something's wrong because so many children don't disclose, don't tell um, that, you know, when they do tell, when they're the hero that tells that something bad is happening, then we have to believe them, support them, and get them the help that they need. Uh, things, things to say, I'm almost done. Things to say is, uh, I believe you, thank you for telling me. With a traffic victim, I have a star by how can I help. If you're not gonna help, don't ask <laughs> how you can help. And help for a human trafficking victim can be extensive, depending on the trauma and their need. Um, Kind things, supportive things, um, not intrusive things, not disbelieving things, not accusatory things. Uh, what not to say, I know how you feel, you don't. Doesn't matter if you've been through your own trauma. A friend of mine that I uh, usually do speaking engagements with had breast cancer and had to have her breast removed. And she says, I can say how I felt when that happened to me, but I can't say how another uh, cancer survivor felt. So don't try to say, oh, I experienced something, you know, tell your story or, um, or you're lucky that. What? No, there's nothing lucky about what happened to them. Um, I can imagine how you feel. No, you can't. Um, just crazy things. I talk to churches often. It's God's will. No, no, it's not. Um, and even if you believe it, don't say it. Um, you know, you should get on with your life. It's not as easy as that. Um, the one, this is one of my favorite slides. Compliance is not consent. Because you see someone complying with the perpetrator does not mean that they want to be there or they want to do it. Um, I'm going to tell a real quick one. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Teresa Flores, but it happened to her 30 years ago. And people, you know, are like, well, she should have done this or she could have done this. What happened was, she took a ride with a guy that she's known for over a year. She thought he was cute. She knew she shouldn't have done it. She did it. He takes her to a house, drugs her, rapes her, takes pictures of it, and then threatens her. I'm going to show your church pastor this. I'm going to show your father's boss this, because he was a big wig. I'm going to post it all over school. And of course, she was drugged, so it made it look consensual. And she was a virgin at the time that this happened. And she was mortified, and she, they're like, you're going to have to work it off. You're going to have to get these pictures back by working it off. And uh, so she thought, like a teenager would, babysitting or cleaning a house or something. And they took her to a house several times a week, sneaking out in the middle of the night, and had people pay them to 
rape her at 15, and it lasted for two years. People are like, well, she should have told somebody. She should have done. You know, they killed, they stole her dog. They shot her dog on the phone with her. They told her, your little brother's next if you talk to anyone. You know, kids believe that stuff. And all I can tell the kids, if you're ever in a circumstance where, where someone's threatening you, trust your parents, trust a teacher, trust somebody, you know, and tell, and tell. You know, it's hard though, and they, and they do believe the threats. With our adult brain, we go, well, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make sense. Well, to a 15-year-old, it does make sense. She saw the pictures. She saw the pictures of herself in that situation. Just because they go along with it doesn't mean they're choosing it, doesn't mean they want it. Uh, many times they threaten to kill the kid's parents or someone that they love, they know. Uh, branding, there's, uh, whoops. Uh, what does that tell you about someone? That is an actual tattoo that they put on a traffic victim. What does it say? You're a piece of property, you're for sale, you're about as good as a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk. This was a tattoo that was put on three women um, that were trafficked out of Chicago. Now, I don't know. I know tattoos are real popular nowadays, but I'm not thinking many people would want that. And this is the latest and greatest uh, on the inside of the mouth. The only upside to this is that your mouth regenerates so much it actually will wear off by itself. Pimps are all sex traffickers. When I talk, I often use he and she. But the reality is women are traffickers. Women are, some of them have kids that, you know, come to their house and sleep on their couch and the next thing you know, you got to do me a favor. So, all right, I'm not going to go through who's next. I'm gonna, the only thing I want to put up is, uh, um, that. So if you have your phone, you want to take a picture, or you want to take down the number, if you suspect something just doesn't seem right in a situation, uh, if it's urgent, you call 911, of course, but if it's something that you're just not sure about, something didn't look right, call that number at Polaris Project, and they'll get a local law enforcement involved. Also, the bottom, number, uh, bottom thing is slaveryfootprint.org. If you want to know how many slaves work for you, go ahead, because I don't have time to talk about the, the chain. Uh, your supply chain for clothes, electronics, food, coffee, chocolate. Um, they may not be trafficked or slaved, you know, enslaved here, but you might have six-year-olds uh, picking uh, coffee beans for your coffee uh, 16 hours a day. So it's still slavery. Sorry. Thank you very much. Now we have um, Courtney Faraday from All Worthy of Love that's going to speak in a little bit of real life situations. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. I'm Courtney, I'm with All Worthy of Love. And what we do is we go out on the streets on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and we try to get the girls off the streets. Not just the girls, but there's also guys. When you think of prostitution, a lot of people think of girls, but it's not just the girls. Actually, a lot of guys go out, too, to fill a drug habit, and if they dress in girls' clothes, they make more money. So it's, it's, it's a scary place out there. Not only do we go out on the, on the weekdays, but um, my husband and I and my son also live down in Heroin District in Detroit. Um, we are committed to reaching as many people as we can um, in, the, in the world that are enslaved in human trafficking because it's really, really scary out there for these girls. Um, so I'm just going to share a couple stories with you. Because we go out and we see it firsthand and we see a lot of the girls and they trust us because we um, aren't out for um, gain for ourselves. We're just out there to help them. We also walk them through rehab and we put them in homes and we try to have somebody walk through the whole process with them until they are um, free to live, but also we don't leave them. We are friends with them. They're our neighbors and our coworkers and um, they're people that need love just like we do. 
There was a girl that we rescued a couple months ago, and I'm changing everyone's names because of legal purposes, but there was a girl we rescued about three months ago. Her name was Sam, and she started um, out with a, a sore throat, which turned into strep. It was a, her freshman year of high school, and she wanted to do really good on her test, so she went in the cabinet and took a Percocet to take away the pain. And she never thought that one pill would change her life. Well, the next week, she took an Oxycontin to go to sleep. And that Oxycontin turned to another Oxycontin and another one. And to the point where she was a $60 a day pill addict. And she was living in a very well-to-do family. And she got straight A's, kind of like what Lieutenant Reyes said, that they get really good grades. And then all of a sudden, there's a decline. She started stealing her mom's jewelry and started taking checks and to the point where finally her parents couldn't do much because she had put them in a $20,000 debt because of the fact that she was cashing in checks that were not able to be cashed in. She turned to heroin because a lot of times what we see is prescription drugs are costing a lot of money and you can't get them as available as you used to be able to get them but heroin is really really cheap right now on the streets and so they switch from doing prescription drugs to heroin a uh, bag of heroin is so much cheaper and it actually they gives them a seven to ten times better high than prescription drugs and it would take them ten times as much prescription drugs to equal one bag of heroin so a lot of the kids that we're seeing on the streets now have switched over to heroin. Heroin is not like we all thought about back in the day where it was able to be shot up. It actually is able to be snorted now. So a lot of kids want to do it because it doesn't leave marks on their arms. We still have some girls that will inject and some that do not. We also have a new drug out on the market right now called Crocodile. It's actually brought over from Russia, and it was a cheaper form of heroin. So they figured out how to mix certain drugs and inject it because it's even cheaper, and it leaves burn holes in people's skins because it's mixed with lighter fluid. So a lot of the girls we come in contact with will have burn marks in their skins. And like all of us, we meet somebody and they come off to be really, really nice and they just want to be our friends. And this is what the pimps do. Not only just male pimps, but female pimps also. Where they'll go out and they'll scout, they'll groom. And that's what we call it, we call it grooming because they will meet some young girls at a mall and hope the girls will come back. They try to learn their schedule. They watch them for a while, and then they start inviting them, saying, hey, you know what, I'm a photographer, you're really pretty, let me take some photo shoots of you. And some of these girls are naive, and they will go with these guys or girls, because we, as young girls, think sometimes it's just the guys. We're not thinking that the women are also going to take a part in this. And so they'll go back and do these photo shoots, and then they'll be drugged and raped, pictures, and be basically blackmailed to work on the streets. Not only that, but then you'll have the girls that, or the guys that are addicted to heroin that are from college and high school and that are looking for a ne their next fix. And they'll go down there and they'll meet a pimp down there. And we see, I saw that a couple weeks ago. I was out and there was two young girls I've never seen before. And I said to them, what are you doing down here? And they said, you know, we needed, dr we needed some drugs and, you know, we needed some money. And so we just thought we could come down here for a couple nights and, and make the money we needed to get our drugs. And, and I said, you are, they are so cute and pretty. And we just were talking to them a little bit. And, and they said to us, you know what, we got into this drug habit. And we met some guys down here. And they're really great to us. And they keep giving us more drugs. And we don't have to pay a thing. And I thought to myself, right, because they're grooming you. They want you to get more addicted. So that way, when you get more addicted, they have payment for that, and they can send you out on the streets. And like Lieutenant Reyes said, Pretty Woman is, is a movie. There's a lot of movies out there um, that show pimps in like this, you know, like we got all this money, we drive really nice cars, and we wear really nice suits. And that's not what they look like. <laughs> They are, most of the time, they are strung out too. They're coping with the drug addiction. They, um, 
had some pretty bad trauma that's happened to them early on in life, and, and I'm not excusing what they do, but they also need help. And the girls on the street, the same. The, the PTSD that Lieutenant Reyes talked about is so prevalent in them. We have girls that have grown up in the foster system. We rescued a girl last month that she was in 24 foster homes from the time she was 10 to the time she was 14. 24. And finally, nobody wanted to deal with her anymore, and so they put her in a group home. Well, of course, she ran away from the group home, and where did she end up? She ended up meeting a guy, and the guy was so nice to her, and he was going to love her forever, and now he's selling her on the street. And it, it's not, I mean, people think that it only happens in Detroit. People think that heroin is a poor inner city drug. It is not. The amount of people that I come in contact with that are from Troy and Rochester and Clarkston are crazy. I mean, before we got involved in this, I thought it was an inner city drug also, or an inner city, this is just the way of life in the inner city. And it's funny because my husband and I sometimes will say, what, what is that white person doing in our neighborhood? And we forget sometimes that we are white, but we think of people that come into our area differently. And so, especially if they're young people, we live in heroin district of Detroit. So why are you coming down here? What are you doing here? What do, what do you want from down here? And asking those questions sometimes is the, the simplest thing to bridge the gap between somebody that's a victim and somebody that's just looking for trouble. There's a lot of kids that think it's cool to come down to Detroit. And all you kids listen to this, <laughs> it is not cool to come down in Detroit and hang out on the street corners. It is not. And there's so many people that are like, I'm going to prove my parents wrong, and I'm going to go down to Detroit, and I'm just going to hang out for a little bit. And that could be the last time you try to prove your parents wrong. It is not a joke. Sex trafficking is not a joke. A lot of our girls that are working the streets, they are not doing it because they want to do it. And a lot of them are filling a drug habit. I mean. I have countless stories I could go on. We just rescued a girl a couple weeks ago, and we brought her to a safe home and tried to get her rehabilitated. And, and I said to her, I said, please do, not come, please do not get out of rehab. She had just got out of prison, and in prison they hold her back checks. And so I knew she was going to get a large, large sum of money. I said, please do not cash that in until after you get out of rehab because most of them do during rehab. It is very hard to kill the habit and they get, their withdrawals are horrible, so they cash in their checks during rehab and then they leave. And she did that. And we saw her on the streets last week and, and she had a wad of money in her pocket. And I said, you need to go home and you need to put that away somewhere because you are gonna get hurt from that. And she is hopefully now listening. She's got herself a house to live in, apartment, and we're hoping that she gets herself away from the guy that was the love of her life because he was the one that was trafficking her. We just came in contact with a lady six months ago, and she, is, she has cancer, and she couldn't get cancer treatments because you can't get cancer treatments when you're on drugs. And they, we were trying to get her in rehab so she could go through cancer. And I said, share your story with me. Tell me what, what brought you to where you are today. And she said, I was a heroin addict when I was a teenager. And I got off heroin and I got married. And we have kids. And we lived a wonderful life. She said, and I was clean for 24 years. And she said, my husband died six months ago. And when my husband died, a friend from the past came out of the blue and said, hey, why don't you just come out with us tonight? I know you're really sad, and we're just going to help you get over the death of your husband. And she did, and she did heroin. And now she's hooked, and now she's got cancer. We finally got her. She wouldn't leave the streets unless we did something with her dog. She loves her dog. We got a home for her dog. She's in rehab right now. She is in remission. So there are good stories that come out of there, but there are some ones that are not good. Like we had a young girl last summer who her pimp was very upset because she wanted to go home to her family in Troy. And when she decided to leave, he shot her and left her in the alley and she died. And she was 16 years old. So it's not a joke out there. And I would say to everybody in here, and especially the kids, it starts with one little 
just take a hit off this joint. Just, and, and that's what we hear from every victim. I was, I was a straight A student. I was doing so good in school. And then I went to a party and I started drinking, or I went too far with a guy, and then he wanted to go further, and then he took me here, and, and this and that. So I'm, I'm saying from somebody that's living and watching what's happening to these women and these young girls, just be on guard. Understand that, I mean, this, it's a lot different than it was before, and probably even different for me than it was for my parents. And, I live three blocks from where my grandparents came over from the old country and they, grew, they raised their kids three blocks from them. My family hates the fact we live there because they moved there, away from there because of how bad it got. But I know that if more people would be aware of what's going on down there and take, and take action towards it, and like Lieutenant Reyes said, like if you're going to offer to help, you need to walk them through the whole process. Eat is very hard and it's a lot of work and there's a lot of um, red tape you have to jump through um, especially the fact that for so long everyone thought that the prostitutes wanted to do this and that they were getting put in jail but I will tell you every prostitute that I talk to every young woman that I talk to on the street says I want to be in jail I want to be in jail because I'm safer in jail than I am out here. Nobody wants to be in jail. But to them, they get meals every day, they get a, a bed to sleep in, and they don't have anybody selling them, and they don't have anyone beating the crap out of them. So I would just say that it is not um, something you hear about on a movie called Taken, that it actually happens in real life. And so we really need to be aware of that for our kids and, and also our, as kids in here, you need to be aware of that as too. You can't just trust everybody that's out there. This concludes our um, presentation. I think all of you for coming out and taking the time to um, come and listen to the presentation and thank you very much have a good evening oh does anybody have any questions sorry question yes okay here i'll run this way cool you know i, I think a lot of people and, and i know that we were we have concerns we've heard things like at great lakes crossing um you were uh that that's a heavy area for this kind of stuff We've had concerns about, you know, your kids want to go to the movies with their friends. And we want to drop them off so they can go. And then you start hearing things from people saying, no, that's a heavy area for a human trap. What, where's the, where's the boundary of, <laughs> how do you feel comfortable dropping your kids off to go to the movie up there? And does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. There's a reoccurring, um, Facebook post that says, you know, the kids were in the movies and somebody tried to wipe stuff on their hand and that's been investigated by Auburn Hills Police. I made contact with them on several occasions and that was found to be unfounded and I'm not going to say that this mall is different than any mall. What I will say is anywhere children are going to be unattended, perpetrators are going there and I'm not saying they're sitting out outside every movie looking for your kid um, but if you ask me, I have three boys, would I drop my kids off at the mall? Absolutely not. But I've been in this business for 28 years, so maybe I'm a little too strict. But, you know, my son wrote a paper one time. He had to write a paper on the worst thing that ever happened to you. And I said, hey, write it on the time you broke your ankle. I already wrote on that. Well, something else. Nothing bad has ever happened to me, Mom. <laughs> Thank goodness, you know. I mean, I know your kids have to have freedom and my kids have freedom they drive and they go places but I'm just very particular you know I get people riled up because on some of these I'll start talking about people ask about sleepovers and I'm like ah, let's not go there you know because people get riled up about it but children can't protect themselves adults job like when I see those Facebook posts where the the little six-year-olds on the playground and the mom's talking to the guy and someone's luring her child away with a dog and 
I told you, don't talk to Kids don't have the developmental capacity to protect themselves. What else do you say when you introduce them to somebody? Well, say hello. Oh, so now you're telling them to talk to the stranger. They don't have it. They do not have the capacity to protect themselves. That's why they have parents. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to kind of ride that wire. I can't tell you what you would do with your own kids, but, you know, my kids tried the, well, my friends get to. I said, don't, because your friends are going to get to a lot of things you're not going to do. They're not tortured and controlled and never let out of the box. It's just... I know what's out there. So, any other questions? I'll you, one back there. Okay, I'll run. <laughs> Get my workout today. Yep. Oh. Hi. Um, you had a slide in your presentation that was how do I protect my kids? Can you go back to that for just a second? You, it was toward a, sort of at the end. Just to prove the fact that, I guess, that, like you said, it can be one of our neighbors. Um, isn't it true that one of the people that was on the Human Trafficking Task Force for Oakland County, wasn't he actually involved in trafficking? A person on the Human Trafficking Task Force? No. Not that, well... I'm on the Human Trafficking Task Force for the state, and I'm on the Human Trafficking Task Force, and I started with Oakland County's Human Trafficking Task Force, and you said he, and we, we not to this date have had a he on our board, which we definitely need, because the whole community is a solution to this, but no. Um, but I've worked with many victims. I mean, I could stay here and tell, just like her, many stories, and... You know, one young lady was trafficked from a Facebook page. She friended somebody, and he lay dormant until she started posting, I hate my parents, my life sucks, blah, 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 swoop, in, out on a date, drugged, sold. It's that easy. Um, other one was here from Clarkston, and she got trafficked when she was in college. You think you send your kid away to college. Well, all kids at college are poor, you know, so there's story after story of how it can happen. Um, but kids, even if you make a mistake in some area and do something you're not supposed to, if someone tries to threaten you over it, tell your parents. It's going to be way better than letting it go on and on. Um, a lot of the Internet stuff happens, you know, and we think, kids, why would you do this? Why would you do that? They'll get on talking to someone on the Internet. They'll get on FaceTime with them. The people will say, hey, we'll show you this and that and this and that if you show us this. The kid does. They think it's a Snapchat or something that disappears. Uh, FYI, it doesn't disappear. Um, secondly, they're on the other end videotaping it. Well, then they play it back for you and say, well, now you have to do this, this, and this. If you get yourself, if you find yourself in a situation like that, stop it early on. They're only going to keep escalating it and threatening you. Um, and sometimes they'll say, I know where you live, and they'll be out in Colorado. So um, be very careful with the Internet stuff. Um, on our Facebook page, um, I found this. If you want to get that slide, um, I found a really cool video. So if you go to the Clarkston Coalition for Youth, um, I believe on April 15th, I posted a video that's actually got a gentleman who is kind of doing um, some luring, but to show parents that their kids are really doing this, and it's all about Facebook and Instagram. And it's a pretty cool video. And there's a girl video and a guy video. And it shows that these kids are making contacts via Instagram, Facebook, and they are being lured to parks, houses. One of them just blew my mind. It was a young boy. He met this person like 15 hours before. They scheduled for this boy to come over to this girl's house. And the girl says, I am going to be in the shower, but I'll leave the door open. I don't know anybody that takes a shower and leaves the door open. But anyways, so the door was unlocked. The boy comes in, 
steps up the steps, kind of like looks around the house, has a seat. In the background, you see like one guy go down and lock the door and another guy come out of a hallway and they grab him and he starts screaming. He's in a house. He's in a suburb neighborhood. No one's hearing him. So the mom comes out and she's like, I cannot believe you. We talked about this. We talked. You're not allowed to talk to strangers. You don't even know this person. That's how simple and easy it is. So I guess this is a slide that I kind of went over fast. And I have a really short video that apparently I skipped over. If um, any of you want to stick around, I know it's getting right to that 8 o'clock hour. We're trying to stick to it. But um, for this one, protect your own children. It's just statistics here. And if you want to go and find the most updated statistics for this stuff, it's Stewards of Children, Darkness to Light. And it talks about, uh, the reason I put it in this, per this slide was because over 90% of children who are commercially sexually exploited have a history of child sexual abuse. So for me, that's kind of my soapbox. Protect your children. If something happens to them, get them help. Um, you know, don't, you have parents, you hear stories of parents saying, that didn't happen, you know, telling their children when they're disclosing and uh, the bravest children ever, you know, to tell, it's, it's really hard for them to tell. Because for some in, in themselves, they, every time something happens to them, they always somehow blame themselves. An eight-year-old can't be blamed for something that an adult did to them or even another child. That's the other thing people fail to realize is that children perp on children. And, you know, it's not just a, oh, you know, they're experimenting at six. Not that that can't happen, but you, you know, a 12-year-old can perp on a nine-year-old. Don't just have children babysitting children. It's not a good plan. Um, I have one short video. Um, maybe. Oh, there we go. There was like 15 of them in a room, and I was really scared. He cut with a knife to be able to penetrate me. I was only five. I was crying because I was scared, and he had sex with me. And that was my first time. I still had on my school uniform. Men who come here to abuse children in Cambodia have 99.9% .9 of the time already abused children in their own countries. in our families, in our communities. It's right under our noses. We frequently see drugs and psychological brainwashing become part of the process of keeping them committed to the offender. Men will actually fly into Atlanta, get on the internet and say, I want a boy who has no hair on his head, no hair anywhere, I want him to look like he's 13, I want him to be no taller than five foot two. Order it, show up here, have sex, and be gone. The sexual exploitation of children has become a cottage industry, driven by the internet. It's very difficult for us to define the problem of child pornography to the American public because it's something we obviously can't show them. There are some of the acts that I couldn't even describe to you against children so young that no normal person could look at that without being disturbed. 
It ain't about sex. It just be about business. That's it. Once you get them to go the first time, then you got a better chance of getting them to keep going. I was really nervous, and I was really scared. And he was holding his gun and shot me. Cannot arrest 11, 12, and 13-year-olds and charge them with prostitution. You cannot criminalize children. I think people view the prostitution like a victimless crime. Most of the girls that we come across nowadays are 13, 14, 15 years old. I know these girls didn't wake up one morning and say, I want to be a prostitute today. There are millions and millions of photos of children who are being sexually abused. Nobody knows who these children are. And it raises the question to us, are there that many pedophiles out there? Or is something else happening? Pretty disturbing, huh? Um, but that's the reality of it. And when they show the number of sex offenders that have been arrested, uh, do you know that sexual assault and sex offenses are the least prosecuted crime? About 1% of offenders spend time in jail. One, victims don't disclose. So it's not, yes, the pedophile that's been convicted, I'm certainly worried about them, but you know, it's not the guy in the white van. Um, women rape children, men rape children, children abuse children. Um, you know, we just have to be more vigilant in protecting our children. And the pedophiles that scare me are the ones that haven't been caught. Because, you know, who are they? You don't know who they are. And, you know, no, I don't want people running around, oh, we're scared of everybody. But be vigilant with the protection of your children is all I can say. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. I know I heard something recently that I thought was helpful. If your kids are at the mall or and any of you kids who are here, if you're at the mall and you think somebody's following you or you feel, you, you're worried because you see someone and something you don't feel is right, you can apparently go into any store in the mall and ask for mall security and they will escort you to a safe place, your parents' vehicle, call your parents, whatever. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're nervous, just know that that is available to you. gut in us that tells us that something's not right, trust that. Because sometimes you think that, oh, somebody's going to think I'm dumb or I'm, I'm, you know, afraid or, or rude. yeah, or rude. rude. Yeah, all the time. No. You know, we have to give your what do we think that is? Be nice. Be respectful. Talk nice to adults. I mean, and I'm not saying go around being rude, but if you're in the mall and someone's coming up telling you you have pretty eyes and they're 27 years old and you're 15, it's okay to be rude. Say, get away from me now, you know, because they have no good intention. No 25-year-old is going to be talking to a 13-year-old if they don't have bad intentions, in my opinion. Just another thing that I used to do with my children when they were teenagers, um, my husband and I would set up a code word for them so that if they were at a party or in a gathering where they felt uncomfortable, they could call us up, give us that word, and we knew, and we would come and get them from wherever they were. It didn't make them look stupid, didn't, you know, they didn't lose face with their friends or whoever they were with. And it worked a lot of times when they were in uncomfortable places. So it's, it's a help. Yeah, that's great. We have that with our uh, son. If something's wrong, he calls up. Why do I have to come home? That means get me out of here. I need to come home. So it's a very good point. Anybody else? Again, I wanted to tell you, thank you very much for spending the time to have this wonderful, inspirational um, presentation.